Let's see. There we go. There we there go. We go. Uh, How are you, boys? Hey. Good How's thing going, you, buddy. How's things, man? Rad, rad, rad. Fantastic. Thanks. How are you guys doing over there? Yeah. Very marvelous. Yeah, good, but it's uh, it's been an early one for me. Um, I had to wake up at like ten to three this morning because my missus's mom uh, needed to be dropped off at the airport. So I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> <That's an early laughs> I woke up at uh, like six to watch the Maple Leafs game. So oh, nice. What's the connection to the hockey? Are you? Have you just? Um... Um, I don't know. I, I know it was mentioned in the show notes that regret check talk that went out on Goldcast. I don't know if yeah. you guys have seen it. Yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I talk about an old lady, Mamie, who moved to, uh, and she used to, when I was a kid, we were super close. She was like, like functioning like a grand. And she used to always talk about going to these Maple Leaf games. And then uh-huh. when I bought my first PlayStation, I was at this stand at the, do you remember the old Ramberg waterfront? Big and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's these guys who sold me the PlayStation there. And I said, like, do you recommend any games? They're like, dude, I know it's going to sound crazy, but this NHL game is so good. <laughs> and I put it in and I started uh, uh, watching and I chose my team. I chose the Maple Leafs. And there was okay. all the players of the same. And I was like, this is the shit. And so I checked TSTV. We didn't have it at that stage. And it said, like, Maple Leafs playing tomorrow night. I was like, this is amazing. So I booked no TSTV for the first time ever. I bought it, not knowing that, like, the Leafs were had maybe two televised games a year. It was just, like, super lucky that it happened to be that one uh, huh. in South Africa. And, uh, and then it started. And then by the end of the playoff season, I was playing inline hockey. And by the next year, I was playing ice hockey. And, no ways. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I went to my first ice hockey game, I was in, um, I think I was in Russia, I think, and and they had like the world champs on or something like that. And I'd I'd never been to a game before. And I'd only realized, like, obviously, when you're watching it, that there's literally two teams on each team, you know, like you have the offense and defense pretty much. And they're like, they're constantly swapping, like literally it's stuff you don't see on TV normally. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, So there's, Four lines, there's four lines of forwards and there's two lines, there's three lines of defense. Okay. So at any given time, you have three forwards and two defenders on in, in at least a typical NHL game. Yeah. And the coach will cycle through those lines. So forwards play about 45 seconds a shift yeah. and defensemen play about 90 seconds a shift. And they're just changing on the fly the yeah. whole time. Wow. Cool. Anyway, well, we're flipping excited. You guys both stand. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, we, we both stand. stand. Yeah, I'm, I'm at a standing desk. Yeah. Yes, it's not, I feel like it's bullshit. It's I got energy. Like, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not going to be the only guy sitting in this podcast. You're going to ah. get a cut for, <laughs> for now. Oh, I'm, I'm piling bread game boxes here. I'm going to make myself. Oh, a, oh, <laughs> very, very, oh cool. Well, we want to talk about yeah. games, so that's good. <laughs> that's I'm gonna gonna a that's about the biggest box of them all. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Hold on a second. This could end in tears. Here we go. But, but there's no way I'm having you guys be standing. I'm like this little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> in Joburg, my at my desk at Missing Link, we've got a, a voodoo board. So it's actually a, a, a balance board. And both Don Packett and I worked the whole day standing on a balance board. So you just... Wow. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. fuck you guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, we don't have a balance board. We're going to have to get balance boards now, Craig. So yeah, exactly. Like board in podcasts, we can just go like this. You're not making enough effort to yeah. yeah. Although there's okay. something to be said for sometimes when something is live. Like when, when I work with guys and they, we're training them in presentation. When they're, when they're just presenting, they'll constantly fix mistakes. Because it's not live, they'll be like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should have rather said this. Yeah, and like, yeah. Dude, like, if you're on the stage, you can't say that. You're just going to roll. But yeah. the cool thing is audience is self-correct. They've got like fixing machines. So you make a mistake. <laughs> they like figure out what you wanted to say. They fix it and you carry on. So sometimes just riffing live is just, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just roll with it. Yeah. No. Cool stuff. Well, good morning there. Rich Mulholland from South Africa. How's it going, my man? Welcome on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Hope you guys are too. Yeah, really good. Thanks, Very much so. So, but we have, a, we have like a lot of people, I guess, to be thankful. And there's quite a few people that uh, we, we also both know. So, one of our previous guests, um, Sean Roberts, actually gave me your contact details. And he's a, he's a good mate of mine as well. And you actually also helped my sister in the past with the presentation and you, you're also good mates and 
part of an organization with her, her boyfriend, Greg Shaw. And it's kind of interesting, like in South Africa, that everyone kind of knows each other in some sort of way, isn't it? I, I wonder, it, like it seems quite unique to South Africa, don't you reckon? Yeah, it's very funny. Like when I travel places, uh, I used to laugh because I'd go someplace and then somebody would say something to me like, oh, you're from South Africa. Oh, do you know? And I want to say to them like 15 million people. But then they say, do you know Mike Stopworth? I'm like, holy crap, I do know Mike Stopworth. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that I guess, uh, yeah, there's a certain business community and within a context, it's actually quite a small world and a lot of people know a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, also, like in EO, the organization I'm part of, it's a very Jewish organization as well. And so uh, that community is even smaller. And also from a business uh, perspective, they're very, very connected. So they know everybody. So that's, Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's really, it is a small world in South Africa. And I, I don't know, I wonder if it's also because like we play so much sports against each other at school. So, you, you know, you're seeing each other every week and stuff. So, yeah, I always, uh, I always like to chat with my mates in London and they're like, oh, I wonder if you know this person. You're like, yeah, 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 of course I know. We used to play <laughs> yeah. It's uh, also very uh, connected and networked. So like people in South Africa are very keen to introduce you to other people and to, so like the, the world gets smaller and smaller uh, very quickly when, when, when you're trying to grow in an entrepreneurial space as well. Like everybody actually wants to help you, even your competition. Yeah. So yeah it's pretty rad. It is very cool. Very cool. I must say, I do like that a lot. Um, so Rich, like maybe we can sort of get on here a little bit and, uh, you, you have a really interesting story in life, uh, but you were, you were born in Scotland and raised in South Africa. So maybe you can just take us back a little bit to the early days and just sort of, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I was born in Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, when I was nine, my dad came over to South Africa for his mom's funeral. Uh, he went, he worked for Scottish television there. He went to, uh, visit South African uh, SABC, South African Broadcasting Corporation while he was here and they offered him a job and like three or four months later uh, we'd moved over. And I think part of the reason was my parents were in a pretty crappy place. They weren't like great as a couple and it was one of those things where they thought like either we're going to call this now, this isn't a great marriage or we're going to try something completely different and just reset our, our world. And they moved here and actually now we're all off to Ireland in July to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. So it was a good move. Wow, that's wow. cool. 50 is a great a, number. It is a big one. Yeah. It must have been a big, uh, a big change for them uh, coming to South Africa from Scotland. Did they know anyone other than their work colleagues? Well, they didn't actually know even work colleagues. They knew both my dad's sisters had moved here and the one lived in Johannesburg. So we knew one person. And I think what wow. changed was, you know, that kind of very British, my dad would come home, he'd go to the pub. Uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, we would walk to, my parents' friends were all friends we were at school with. They were all like drinking buddies. So there was lots of like going, going for drinks, going for a curry, doing this. Uh, life was on repeat. And I think that they were just feeling quite like caught in this very, very small world of not even Glasgow or Scotland. It was like this, you know, two block radius in the West end of Glasgow was the, mm -hmm. was the universe in which we operated, even though my dad traveled a lot for work. And I think you just needed to shake things up a bit. And uh, uh, by moving here and knowing nobody as a family, we had to tighten a little bit and, and of course meet new people, new friends. And it was just enough to, to kickstart a new, a new thing for them. I mean, they still bicker every day. They're hilarious to watch, you know, like when they're cooking dinner. Like, Brian, what are you doing? Brian, shut up, I'm cooking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the two of them are like that the whole time. But then, you know, they're amazing. As I said, it's their 50th now. And we all live within, my, both my sisters and their families and my parents all live within like a one kilometer radius. Ah, uh, wow, that's so In cool. Cape Town, is that right? Yeah. We, yeah. we moved to Joburg, then my sister moved down, my other sister, then my parents, then, then myself. Nice. I was listening to you on another podcast yesterday and you were talking about your get togethers and your dinners and stuff. And it's like a huge occasion. You have 45 <laughs> people or so everyone with their kids and it must be quite a festive gathering. It is. And I'm always like the party pooper. So I don't drink and my whole family are big drinkers. And so I always try and engineer, like, how can I get these guys in so like anytime like on sunday we had a big brunch at us and i realized if i invite them early nobody can get pissed and like even <laughs> on my birthday i'll say to them guys you're uh, we're having like come to my house it's my birthday uh five o'clock but you must all piss off up by seven because i want to have dinner <laughs> with jazz and the kids and my dad is like right everybody got 30 minutes before he kicks us out you know <laughs> and there's like this massive like influx of people and then they all go away 
and then even in their oh. Christmas dinner, by the time we get to, if we're hosting, by the time it gets to seven, I can see what's happened. Like we've had dessert, we've had coffees. Now everyone's getting in for the long haul, right? They're getting excited. Oh yeah. You got to piss off now, right? You got to leave, and, uh, I, and I hook them out, and they'll laugh, and and that's just the that's just the way it goes. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, w- w- when did you give up booze? Uh, when I was nineteen. Wow. Okay. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. cold turkey. Uh, not really. Probably over the course of like a year. So, uh, do you guys ever hear of a nightclub called the White Horse Inn? Yes, big time, yeah. So it was like a quite a famous club when I was young and I, we used to play a game called Coinage where you bounce glasses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't play Coinage, I lost at Coinage. That was just like my party trick. And one night I got absolutely rat assed and I was uh, walking up to apparently this girl and I was flirting with this girl on the dance floor and whatever I was saying was inappropriate and she kept on snapping me. Then I'd walk back and then I'd walk back again and say something and then she'd snap me and then, and I don't know what I'd say, but it became a bit of a joke that she was just standing there waiting for me and I would just walk up to her, I wouldn't open my mouth and she'd snap me and everyone would laugh. And I don't remember any of this. All I remember is the next week going back and everyone's like, dude, you're a snappy face guy. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a happy face guy. And then I and I was so ill and I had like felt like alcohol poisoning, but it probably wasn't. It was just Sambuca puke. And uh, I just thought, no, I've got to lay off the high tech. And I just went to beer for a while. And I didn't really even enjoy it that much. And within like the course of a year, I'd stopped drinking that and just started drinking like a the odd can of Coke. And it was never like a concerted decision to stop drinking. It just kind of fizzled out. And, but then, you know, I do realize coming from a family that's almost built uh, around alcohol, it's, it's quite easy to not, for me anyway, to not want that to be my, my thing. So, so it, 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 I think it fits my personality uh, better, not, not being a drinker. Okay. Uh, but we it's, certainly always have loads of uh, wine and booze and everybody else in my family, my wife, are really <laughs> drink. Yeah. It's still pretty astute of you to, like at that age, to kind of go down that path, even though, I mean, everyone's had a big bend and say, I'm never drinking again, but then, you know, the same night, you're probably drinking again. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah, still yeah, pretty sure. right. like shit or get off the pot. You know, if you're going to commit and say something, do it. It was also <laughs> that like, I mean, I was expelled from Bryanson high school in matric for drinking. And like, oh. it was like fun to drink when, when you weren't allowed to. But actually, so first of all, alcohol was never a taboo in my house. Like when I was 16, my dad would give me a beer, you know, at a family braai and, and it was never like a, a big deal. Uh, so it never felt like I was rebelling. But actually, after school, it felt like if you want to be different, uh, being a non-drinker is a mm-hmm. lot more remarkable than being a, somebody who goes out and gets pissed. And I think I've always, I said to my son, my son used to say to me, you know, I, I don't fit in that. I don't fit in. I said, you know, kid, don't worry about it. You're going to spend the first 20 years of your life trying to fit in and you're going to spend the next 60 years of your life trying to stand out. So mm-hmm. don't worry that you don't fit in. The time for people who don't fit in comes, uh, you know, uh, comes later. And I think I was always mindful that I wanted to be a little bit different. And in my mind, being the, the one person at the nightclub who didn't drink was a lot more remarkable than being the thousands who do. And it sounds quite stupid when I say it now, like a, a silly thing to do to want to stand out, but there you have it. Yeah, well, well done. That, that's, that's really cool, actually. Um, and what was it like for you moving from Scotland to South Africa and then growing up in apartheid? Maybe you can just explain a little bit what it was like growing up in apartheid for you, and even if you noticed it. So, well, so the first thing is, um, absolutely didn't notice it. In fact, I used to remember I was interviewed in a podcast recently, and we were talking about this. So the first thing is apartheid was uh, legalized here, but it existed everywhere. When my parents left Scotland, a black couple came to see the house that we were selling and uh, had made an offer. And the neighbors in the estate got together and said to my parents, listen, uh, don't accept these people's offer. We would rather all chip in. We'll buy your house and sell it independently later. Oh, no. So racism existed everywhere. The only thing is in South Africa was systemized and legalized and things like this. Uh, <clears throat> The most embarrassing thing, I think, looking back at my youth is the denial that I had for this thing. I don't understand how I didn't notice it. I don't understand how it wasn't a big deal. I do know that my parents, you know, we went to private schools that had black kids and things like this, but those kids could never come to our birthday parties because, you know, they were taxied in uh, uh, from Soweto and stuff like this. So even though I was always at school with kids of different races, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was mindful that I had a housekeeper that wasn't paid as much. And I think you just fell into it. 
And I remember like we used to watch these, like people would come over and visit from the UK and they would talk about this racism. I was saying, oh, it's propaganda. You know, the BBC comes here and they throw sweets for children and then they, they you know, get video footage of these kids uh, grabbing sweets and you think that's how life is, but it's not. But it was complete and utter denial from our side. Like even as a kid, you're in absolute denial of how uh, deeply entrenched this was. And it's certainly not an excuse, but it's a, a, an amazing cautionary aside to realize how quickly you can uh, paint a picture of the universe around you to make yourself think it's okay. And you will convince yourself that this is what it is and, and normalize. And it gives you some degree of understanding how other things could have happened, how things like Nazi Germany could have come into play. Uh, when people who were probably otherwise reasonable people acted in a way that they felt was reasonable, but even when they look back, it's like so horrific. But in, when you're inside the bubble, you know, it's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. And, and I think that's what happened. And it's a, an amazing uh, self-reflection uh, when, I, when I think about it. Because in truth, it was, I wish I could say to you, it was such a shock. We came here and it was terrible and we're activists against it. But it wasn't. We came here and we were comfortable. And life was good and life was better, right? We had a housekeeper and nobody had to do ironing. Everything was amazing. And we very, very quickly fell into the rhythm of just being a white family in South Africa. Uh, so, yeah. I think it's very easy to, to do that. But also, you can imagine, I mean, you fell into it fairly suddenly. But imagine if it's second or third generation. Uh, I mean, you, you've got the slow cook. I mean, there's no, you know, and once again, no excuse, obviously. But you can imagine how that can happen when your parents talk a certain way, your grandparents talk a certain way. And uh, eventually, that's just normalized 100%. And then there's a big sort of a machine behind that trying to make it normal. So um, it, it is a big cautionary tale. What's exciting to me, and I, I think that if you were to look at you know, the angry students uh, at the moment, it, you wouldn't think it's true. But what amazed me was actually, uh, and what we don't talk about enough, is how rapidly it actually changed. Like once they took the blinkers off, everyone looked around. It's like we woke up from a bad dream and we're like, holy shit, we've got to be better. And for the most part, I thought those first like 10 years of this new South Africa was magnificent how well we changed. It's actually, I feel almost that we've regressed into a little bit of anger uh, now, almost more unnecessary than is needed. Uh, I don't think anger is the right approach to fix the problems that still exist here. I think there's a better way of doing things. And I certainly don't think vilifying further is helpful. Uh, I think it's about looking forward, not looking back. But, uh, Rich, I, I think about this so much, actually, like, the thing is, we, we have no clue. We're like privileged white people, okay? We actually have no clue what it was like, you know, growing up like that. And in a way, you can kind of understand the anger, you know, that, that, that exists because this is something that's drummed into you every single day of your life. And it's going to make you kind of angry in a way. I'm not saying that it's the right way that, you know, certain things that are happening now is the right thing, but you can understand people being really angry and really sad and, and, and kind of maybe wanting a bit of revenge. You know what I mean? If you put yourself in their shoes and you really think about it. No, I don't no. understand it at all. No, not in the least. I, I personally, I'm not saying I just don't, I don't get it as a rationale. I think it's just not smart. I think it's just not the right way. Like it, it's shit that things happen. And I, like I often get angry about things in my life that have happened, but um, anger is such a wasted emotion for me that I very, very rapidly try and minimize it. Like I, I can have a, I can get C red and I can try and rationalize because uh, there are three versions of me. There's past me, present me and future me. And uh, I have to be a better, the only thing I can control is what I do for future version of me. And anger will never, anger of, present me never ever ends up helping future me and so I very very quickly I can understand why you could say that it, it could happen except that there's this weird in between generation the people who actually lived in it right? we're not talking about 20 year olds we're talking about 20 year olds who are angry after the fact but actually uh, the people who lived through it who we're talking about that's not where the anger exists the people who deserve to be angry the generation that grew up in shit hovels and who had a horrible life, and they lived in those hovels because they were forced to, right? who had to carry around pass cards and, and answer to police by showing them that they were allowed to walk in the streets and be home before dark. These people lived in, in a science fiction writer's dystopian future, and it was their reality. They're not the angry ones. They're not the ones who are getting angry and, and uh, hating on people. They're the ones who are just happy that we're moving forward. 
the people who are angriest are the people who are born outside of apartheid and who are maybe frustrated because all of these years later, things have, have changed. And I think it is right you can understand being somewhat angry about what happened to your parents and maybe the, the tough start you had, but our start is relative. And I mean, again, it's not that I think that they, I would ever say to somebody, you can't be angry. I'm just saying that being angry is simply not going to be the right tool that's going to help you uh, change your life. So whether it's, whether it's understandable or not is largely irrelevant. Um, is it going to be the best approach going forward? Almost certainly not. Of course. Uh, we, we get dealt a hand. So I'm, a, I'm not religious in any way. So I don't believe in purpose or anything like this. I believe that we have a hand that we get dealt. And it's a good hand or a shit hand or whatever happens. But your life is defined by how well you play the cards you've been given. And, you know, I, I grew up, you talk about privilege, and I absolutely did, but my parents were flat broke our entire life. I didn't go to university. I finished in school. One guy did worse than me, and the guy who did worse than him failed. It wasn't like, I, you know, I, I had a job that I was paid 400 grand a week when I left school, and I quit that job. I started a company with one month salary, and I just knocked door to door and sold. Now, we can talk about privilege, and I'm sure there were all things that were all working in my favor, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I just... I had this hand of cards and I played it as best as I possibly could. And there was no, you know, complaining that I didn't go to university and that I didn't have a, you know, a great network and things like that was, was useless for me. So I think we need to be better about our future self. We need to pay more attention to what we're doing for our future self than what was done to our past self. Yeah, true. Yeah, well said. I, I guess there's a sliding scale and there's a half-life of anger and to try and figure out what that is, there has to be a half-life. And uh, I suppose what is reasonable for that is is the question uh, and not an easy one, obviously. But um, I agreed with you, the, the, the tools moving forward are definitely not, uh, not, not anger and not um, hatred, you know. Um, so just moving on a little bit, uh, Rich, just talking about uh, your life growing up and stuff. Was, was music always a a big role or played it did it always play a big role in your life as a youngster and growing up i mean yeah definitely my parents just loved music so i grew up with the uh, i mean abba and john denver and music from the 60s and all this crap and every car trip was a like the idea of like what my kids now have with everybody on earphones i mean there'll be times where we'll be driving my wife will be listening to one music i'll be listening to a podcast and my kids will be you know listening to something else that didn't exist that we were driving and everybody had uh, the music blaring and we're all singing and we try to bring that in uh, more and more but that was that and then my sisters were both into metal and uh, i was a young brother so when i was like 11 or 12 like they made me these little you know cut off denim jackets with the patches <laughs> then by the time i was 15 uh, they were all into this kind of acid house uh technotronic type music and then they were dressing up in Paisley shirts and Beetle Crusher <laughs> shoes. And basically, I was like a doll for my sisters to dress up. And so, I, so, like, my decisions were made for me. And it was only after school, like, actually, when I just started Missing Link and one of the staff was playing The Offspring. Huh. And I was like, ah, oh, this, this is me. I find me. And I remember Smart. walking into, yeah, it was, well, it was the, the album was Ixna and the Ombre that I first heard. Oh, but then I very quickly I went into Smash. And I remember walking into a music shop. And uh, I, I walked up to the counter and I saw this guy had this long black hair. And, and I said to him, listen, I want music like the offspring. And he said, well, here's what I can tell you to listen to. And he gave me a uh, bad religion, no control and no effects so long. And thanks for all the shoes. And um, those two albums, like changed my life and the offspring. And in fact, every, almost every single member of staff of that music shop ended up coming to work for Missing Link. The guy who ended that was Dave Mayer. He ended up becoming our head of strategy for years. And so we built this entire organization around this kind of punk rock ethic and culture and stuff. Oh, that's such a cool that's story. That's super cool. I, uh, we were talking about um, the Rambo waterfront uh, at the start of this. And I always remember going to the Rambo waterfront and there was a place called Captain Fantastic. And um, they always used to play uh, the offspring there. And I think I can't remember the name of the song, but it was number three. Um, on the, on the TV, but it was, and I always remember when that thing came on, and the, the whole crowd used to go crazy. And I actually still listen to to that Smash album when I go to when I go to the gym now because I don't know, it just reminds me. Smash of, is amazing. Yeah, that was for many, many years, many years, the best-selling independent album of all time. Like up wow. until um, you know mid to late uh, 2010 kind of area. It was like for years consistently. And that guy is like a biochemist. He's a yeah. professor, Dexter Holland. 
I don't know if you know the the lead singer Dexter. Uh, he's like this crazy ass biochemist guy, like, uh, and the lead guitarist Noodles was his high school janitor. No way! No way. <laughs> How cool is that? That's such yeah. a cool story. <laughs> yeah. But you know, with with um, with that album as well, it, well, with Offspring in general, I remember because I'm a little bit younger than you, but um, I remember everyone going, "Oh, that's satanistic," or like, "It's bad," <laughs> you know, like at school. I, and, and then, and and you know, you you go, "Oh, geez, you know, mate, it is quite hectic," but I still kind of like it. And then only afterwards, like later on, you actually like get the lyrics. You like you read the lyrics or whatever, and you realize, like this was like anti-establishment. It was like great music. Like the lyrics were really good, and like caring for others, like learn to help others. And it was so funny because all the, the you know these conservative schools and stuff were like you may not play things like the Offspring and stuff like it. So ridiculous, eh? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. I mean, that was my life growing up. I was big into Dungeons and Dragons as well. And in fact, right now, it's probably the, the it, it kind of game, the game space, and even a lot of the heavier bands, they're quite dominated by Christian and people who believe in things. And but and even in Dungeons and Dragons, like this idea, I mean, it was just kids using their imagination, fighting evil. Like almost always, you went out there and you were like trying to save villagers and fighting evil, but like, nope, that's satanistic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's terrible. And, uh, I realized, like, I don't know how I turned out okay because uh, everything <laughs> in my life, like, you'd think I, I'd kill puppies for fun. Yeah. <laughs> and was, was Dungeons and Dragons, was it a board game? Um, no, it was a game facilitated, a tabletop game. So, uh, what would happen is you'd have a dungeon master. And he would control a story. So he would have a story arc. He would say, you know, villagers have told you there's a werewolf out in the forests. Uh, you know, there's a reward to capture it. Do you want to help them? And you're like, yes, we do. And then you would say, so, so, you'd say, so what do you do? He said, well, let's go find some information. Let's go to a pub. And you would say, we walk into a tavern. And you'd say, you walk into a tavern. You see around you a man skulking in the corner. And you're like, oh, maybe this is a werewolf. I said, what are you going to do? And he said, well, let's walk up and talk to the guy. Who's going to talk to him? And then you just decide amongst yourself. And then, you know, they'll, he'll tell you a story. And then you decide what to do. And it's kind of like this whole big improv idea. And so there's no board but until you have a battle. And then he'll put out a little kind of grid piece of paper in front of you and you put your little figures just so that you know where you're standing relative to a monster or something. And then you roll dice and you're fighting and you get this critical hit and you'll cheer. And I mean, that was my life growing up. The guys would come over to my house when I was 16 and my parents had this garage so we just filled with old stuff and we, we had to crawl through a secret passage in the back. We built this kind of dungeon and we'd sit there, we'd come out and then we would, uh, uh, eat two minute noodles and we'd go back in again. And then in the evenings we'd go ice skate and pick up girls and then we'd come back and, and play Dungeons and Dragons again. It was like a very like weird <laughs> coexistence. <laughs> I mean, you know, I want to stick with my friends all day long and play Dungeons and Dragons, but also I'm 15 years old and 16 years old and like I can only masturbate so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to fantasize about one day getting laid and go there and pick up girls. And it was amazing. If we, I remember this one day going to the ice rink and like uh, kissing like two or three girls. And the, the thing that happened earlier that day is we'd slayed our first blue dragon. And <laughs> this, this for me is my first dragon. And I remember writing a column once years later, actually for Playboy, on how uh, people who watch sports games, their testosterone levels actually increase when another team wins, even if they're watching it remotely. If you're watching a rugby game uh, from the UK and, and the Springboks win, uh, if you went out, if they measured you, you would be more manly that night and more confident and you're more likely. And so we stayed this dragon in a fake virtual game, a fake virtual dragon, but we still walked in like, hello there, how are you ladies? <laughs> <laughs> dragon slayer. And uh, it's like this weird thing that happens. Like you feel more confident. We'd have a great day. So. Uh, that's cool. Man. Except you didn't tell any of the girls you were playing Dungeons and Dragons. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't Absolutely have got anything. not. <laughs> <laughs> what goes in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we dress up very paisley that my sister would buy me and uh, go out there and just pretend that we're normal. <laughs> uh, classic. <laughs> so, so, Rich, you also have a, a love of um, board games, and I'd, I'd love to get into that in, in a second. Um, I've actually just finished this book called The Revenge of Analog. And it's a super interesting book. And it's, you know, in our digital world now, it talks about the things that are making a comeback in the analog world, you know, things like vinyl. Actually, one of the things they talk about is paper, which is quite nice because, you know, you've got your own business as well. So they speak about moleskin in that fair bit. Um, but then the other one is revenge of like board games. 
and how these shops are popping up around the world where you literally go and play board games. And actually one of them is in, in Toronto. It's a massive one. And they, they literally, that is. yes, that's exactly it. That's yeah, it in the yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's the one he talks about. And it, it, it's really fascinating. And I actually think there's a lot you can, you can also learn from board games. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your love of them and where that came from. So playing Dungeons and Dragons obviously was a big, big part of that. So after school, then there was a game that came out by a guy called Richard Garfield uh, uh, called Magic the Gathering. And it was like a card game, two-player head-to-head card game. I became obsessed with it. That's what I spent all my first salaries on, uh, uh, playing maybe from about 2021. I was playing a, a, a lot of that. And I would carried on playing on and off up until in my... I, I'm always very obsessed with any hobby I'm doing and my life can always be measured on different hobbies, different things that I'm doing. There'll always be some degree of obsession going on somewhere else that doesn't uh, work to a degree. And uh, I, I kind of filtered out a little bit maybe in my early thirties and then around 2013, I started really playing again. And now like my collection is about a thousand two hundred games. I've played last year, not so many. I had 650 instances of gameplay in the year. So an average of two games a day. <laughs> the year before I did 997. I was like so bummed because it only looked like a week later. I would have squeezed in three more. But oh. uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah and and uh, I, I really like the social aspects of it. I also think there's a massive, the, the new book I'm working on is called The Death of Strategy. And it ties like a lot of what we've learned about uh, board game and, and how people play and play dynamics into this idea of uh, how we should be thinking about strategy going forward. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and and the, 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 do you sort of bring some of that game strategy into business and life as well? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, we can get to the life bit in a second. Uh, there's actually a lot what I was saying earlier on about this hand of cards you've been dealt. But um, in work, absolutely. So I, I remembered we were doing a one of Missing Link's uh, kind of strategy summits for the year. And I've been playing this game and I realized a couple of things. The first thing I realized is that if I played games the way I ran my business, I would never win. Right? Because when you play a game, you're always playing in an active pursuit of victory. I just, everything you do is about, I will, I will win or die trying, right? So, whereas in business, it's not that zero sum game. You're actually often playing the game to not lose. So once you become established, when you start a company, when I started Missing Link, I was 22, 23 years old. Uh, I had nothing to lose. You know, I didn't really have any, I bought a house quite early, but I didn't have much debt. Like there was really nothing to lose. But, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years, now you've got kids and a family and houses and, and also other people who work for you. And so now a lot of your decisions are, are made based on what can I do right now that will mitigate risk the most. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys, like if you look at all the top investors in the world, they say that's the first thing you figure out is not how do I make money, but how do I, what do I do right now to make sure I don't lose money? Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense to some, some degree, but it changes the rules. Whereas when you're playing a game, you're always actively pursuing victory. And we work out how can we bring that thinking into business? So that was the first thing. So I wanted to say to my guys, like, what would we do if we weren't trying to not lose? What would we do if we we're trying to win? And then the next thing we realized is there were certain mechanisms in a game that would behave a certain way. The game we were playing was a game called Star Realms, that you would make certain decisions. But if I mapped our staff members onto the cards, I would realize that um, we would have made very, very different decisions of Missing Link. And I actually asked the guys to map it out. We ended up using the cards and trying to map out how the business would look. And then the other thing we realized is we confused uh, progression because you're, in a small business, people are people. So when somebody goes from there to there and then there to there, it looks like you're really, really growing staff throughout a company. But in a board game, they're not, they're not people. They're little like pawns. And actually all the pawns look the same. And what I realized is Missing Link for like five years before that had actually maintained a, a, a very, very static game state. The board hadn't progressed. People had progressed throughout the board, but then some had fallen out the top and others had fallen in. So mm. we, were, we had this illusion of movement uh, within an organization, but it actually hadn't. And once I realized that, and I realized it was true for us, I thought, well, this could be true for other businesses. So then we started bringing that thinking into some of our clients and some of our facilitations. 
And then we started coming up with this idea of a victory condition design, which is uh, in a game, the most important facet to any game if I wanna teach you is I'm gonna teach you how to win. And once you understand how to win, all your decisions change around that idea. But if you go to a company and you'd ask them to define what their current victory condition is, often they, they can't, it's not tangible. So we said, well, how can we turn that into tangible thinking? How can we create a strategic destination rather than a strategy, a victory condition? And then that's become quite a, a good product from Missing Link and uh, we sell a lot and we've done it for, you know, exco's of some of the top companies in the country. Oh, that's, that's really fascinating. Is that, is that roots of game theory or is that, is that sort of a little bit... There's degrees of game theory in there. Game theory is a branch of mathematics, uh, you know, by Nash more than, uh, and a lot of it applies to gaming, but uh, it's, it's almost like theory of game design and game thinking and ludology. Uh, there's a, a great book called Game Tech, G-A-M-E-T-E-K. Uh, and it's also a fantastic podcast. And there's like a long episode which talks about long form game design. And then every second episode is a short five minute one. And it talks about like, uh, mathematical probabilities and, and disciplines and real life examples and how they apply to game design and thinking. But it like changes your mindset around everything. It's like almost behavioral economics type stuff. Uh, and uh, so much of our life can be mathed out, but we don't wow. because we're human beings. So we don't see, we see it as people and real things rather than, you know, pawns. And sometimes it's better to abstract things. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, and, so go ahead. No, all good, bud. Go. So, so just moving um, forward a little bit, uh, we obviously come back to what you're busy with and then the sort of um, your businesses and that kind of thing. We obviously delve into that in a bit. But uh, coming a little bit back to some music, while you were um, still in South Africa, while you were in South Africa working at Spur, which is like a, a <laughs> famous uh, restaurant chain in South Africa, uh, you got your first little breakthrough into the music scene with um, the help of your dad. Um, to help out with Depeche Mode, is that right? And tell us a little bit about that uh, evolution. So that was probably, I mean, uh, I've, I could track my life through my favorite bands at different eras of my life. And I probably just as I was finishing school, Depeche Mode was my, was my favorite band. And uh, they arrived in South Africa, they were, they were coming, and I'd gone to my dad and said, Dad, listen. In fact, I'd, I'd been to see the band OMD two weeks before. And uh, then I'd said to my dad, listen, please, can you, he used to work for a company called PA Sound. He was a general manager there. When uh, Paul Simon came out to South Africa, there was a guy's office that was bombed. That was my dad's office. Wow. And uh, it was like in a protest and things. And um, uh, he'd, he'd left. He actually was no longer in the industry, but he still knew some people. And I said to him, please, just that. I'll lick the stage clean. I'll do whatever it takes. Just, <laughs> I want to work on this show. And so uh, he takes me to Standard Bank Arena. I remember I'm walking in. And he says, do you want to do sound? And both my dad and my sister were involved in sound. And I was like, well, I think I'd like to do something different. This is obviously a, a constant theme for me. And uh, <laughs> uh, then what about lighting? And I remember from OMD a few weeks before, there were these moving lights. And I was so blown away by them. They were called icons. And it was a lighting system I went on to specialize in. And I said, no, I'd like to do that. And then he went and introduced me to the lighting crew. And so I got the job and then a few weeks later, AHA was coming out and I was just a stagehand. The stagehand is like, you're not part of the crew. You're just a person who arrives and, and works. And then I got some work at AHA and then Brian Adams was coming after that. And I said to the production manager, if I can get to the other shows, because you'd never toured if you were a, a stagehand. If I can get to the other shows, would you give me stagehand work? And he said, sure. And then I went to the merchandising guy, uh, who's a Scottish guy. And I said to him, listen, if I can, uh, uh, when my my stagehand calls finished, could I work with you in the merch stand? And he said, sure. So I, I got on and I hitchhiked. And then I, I went to the Sun City show and I, I paid the truck driver. I said, I'll give you all my salary that I earn as a stagehand if you can get me to the gig. And so I drove in the truck and myself and my friend. And it was just lucky because I banked that I could make enough money doing the merchandise sales that I would cover. And the truck, luckily for me, broke down. And it was, a, it was like a real big problem. And because we were there, we were able to sort it out, let people know what happened. There was no cell phones or anything in those days. Offload the truck, reload it. I'd actually packed the truck in, uh, before, so I knew how the guys wanted it. And so we'd really, really done a good job of that. And then after that tour, I also would work on the small gigs that, so that the other stagehands didn't want to work on. 
and uh, the owner of the uh, lighting company came up to me and he said, you know, is this Israeli guy? He's like, Habibi, my crew told me that you, this guy, and uh, would you like to come and work with us full time? I was like, yes. And that was it. <laughs> and I uh, quit my waitering job. And uh, my first tour was uh, a Joe Cocker. It was a back-to-back -back gig. So it was Joe Cocker one day. And then the next day, Dr. Alban and Hadaway. Nice. And then from then, it just was over and over and over again. We were like, it was the touring heyday in South Africa. There was just bands every other week. Wow. Nice. Head away. What's his, the song Life? Like, uh, uh, what is love? <laughs> yeah. 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 Baby, don't hurt me. Head yeah. 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 exactly. away, away and Dr. Alban hated each other. It was hilarious. No ways. <laughs> yeah, it was unbelievable. So Hadaway would come and sit with us in catering. And then he called Dr. Alban Pineapple Head. <laughs> and then you know, there's pineapple head walking in and then these two guys and they would come in and they would diss each other in catering like oh you don't even have a real band you got no bass vocalists and stuff and yeah it was like hectic uh but very amusing for me to watch like they were just dudes <laughs> right they're just like dudes who were on tour and either liked each other or didn't and it was it was rad it was cool to be part of yeah that's did you cool. ever meet um dave gahan or any of the guys from depeche mode no, so my funny story about them is one of my jobs was to help set up the dressing room, which I thought was really cool. I was like, oh my God, I'm so close. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but the band uh, apparently didn't like each other so much. And one of the jobs I had to do was there was a dressing room and then there was a kind of one of these open areas that just went through to the bathrooms. And I had to build a, uh, a sheet that would separate the door to the bathroom so they didn't even have to see each other. David Garn wanted to be separate to Martin Gore, Alan Wilder, and Andrew Fletcher. And so they were in one change room, but they had to be so separate that they wouldn't even pass wow. each other walking through the door to the toilet. That's Jeez. how crazy it was. Wow. So I don't know if it was a bad time because he went on to do other things. That was the devotional tour, Songs of Faith and Devotion. Uh -huh. And I, they've had other albums and other things after that. So maybe they were just in a shitty place. And, well, and also, you know, even on tour, when, when I did end up touring with the guys, you're with these people all the time. And I wasn't a drinker by then. And uh, every night, every day, you're working all day together. You're with the same people all the time. That actually, I would just want to not be around them as yeah. after work and things. So maybe that's what, what they were going through. But uh, yeah, it was quite weird. Yeah, for sure. J just one question. Something that you spoke about uh, somewhere was you, you often referred to as uh, Brian Mulholland's son, which is obviously your dad. What, was that because he was like a, a bit of a legend in the industry or what, what was the, the thinking and reasoning behind that? Yeah, like my dad is like an award-winning sound engineer. He won ITs awards back in the day when every South African would watch the ITs. You know, it was like a thing you did at you know at school the next day. I was like, yeah, what up, bitches? You know, woo! It was all exciting. My dad had won <laughs> ITs, and uh, it, uh, relatively again, as we mentioned earlier, South Africa is a relatively small place, and uh, my dad was big and Scottish and and quite iconic. And being, you know, the involved in the industry and very, very well known in that space. If I was a youngster called Mulholland, it was like obvious. And that was just how I was introduced to everybody. Like, oh, this is Brian Mulholland's son. To the point that I was like, I wanted to say to people like, my name is Richard, you know, I, I have an identity. But also, you know, I'm very proud of my dad and he's, he's an amazing human being. So it was cool. But one of the highlights for me was that first time I was walking with my dad or my, and it was like, he was introduced as Richard Mulholland's father. I was like, yeah. uh, cool. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Okay, cool. Finally. Uh, it's, it's but you know, I mean, I'm still like, I don't know how it is with your folks, but uh, I'm still their baby boy. And yeah. my mom was like four foot nothing. And I, I, she still worries when I drive. And you know, the other day, she <laughs> We did a Facebook live video of us dancing in a car and my mom at midnight ready is like, you know, Richard, you know, you could get hurt and you must be careful and message <laughs> me when you're home. And so, you know, you'll always be uh, the the little boy to your to your folks. And yeah. so, uh, so I, I never mind being Brian Mulholland's son. I take it as a as a uh, privilege. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I know the feeling like uh, my mom will like when I tell her I'm going traveling somewhere, she'll be like, Can you know, just make sure that you're safe and, and stuff? And I'll be like Okay, Ma, I have been traveling around the world for 20 years, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to know they care. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so did you have any other like anecdotes and stuff with some of the bands that you work for? Like, for example, the Depeche Mode guys not getting on. Did you have, were there any other like things that stood out? I mean, there was so many. There's so many different stories and different things. Uh, I, like I reflect on in different contexts. I mean, there's obviously the kind of, I've got over there the drumstick of the 
uh, Rick Allen, who's the one-armed drummer from uh, Def Leppard. Yeah. And it's cool. Like, I grabbed the stick after the show, and you only grab one because that's all he plays with. <laughs> and it had this little stick, stick man uh, drawn on it. Like, obviously, it's, like, branded on it. And it says, Rick Allen, Thunder God. This wow. little one-armed stick no man. No way. Wow. But we would play football with them before the gigs. They would call us down, and it was a crew versus band. And Rick Allen was a goalie, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, so, yeah, in a sport where you play with your feet, there's only one guy who can use his hands. And yeah. the guy with one arm is the goalie. Yeah. Oh, well, he was obviously super talented there with uh, uh, just yeah. one hand, that's for sure. Yeah, that, I'd never seen a drum rig like that before. It just pedals everywhere. Wow. Was, uh, his feet were amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. And some people are just so talented, but it just really makes you like, you know, uh, yeah, I just like makes you appreciate things you know so much more that's for sure i tell you what it was the best uh there, without a doubt uh, my unfair advantage in life was that when other people were sent to university i was sent as part of a road crew i cannot i, I cannot mm. explain to you the the work ethic that gets instilled in you uh that obviously you don't have working hours at all mm. uh, you do what needs to be done to get shit you know working uh there the idea of like building something and then seeing these thousands of people in front of you. I remember one little anecdote that I'll tell you is uh, UB40 came out. It was, I think, the Rat in My Kitchen tour. Uh, I actually mentioned this once in a video I did, but uh, we were up at the top of the, the, the stadium. I think it was in PE or it could have been in Cape Town. And they have a thing in the front of speakers called a scrim, which if you, if you picture a big stage, you have that, the stage, you have the speaker stacks at the side and often they'll put a big backdrop, so like a visual on on the canvas in front of the speakers and the wind had picked up so much that it looked like the the scrum was going to blow off so my boss tim dunn had said to me uh, listen we've got to go up and we've got to cut off this this scrim because if it falls it's it's like a really really light material and a light pole but if it had fallen on the audience it would have looked like the stage was falling down it would have caused panic and uh, so we, we climb up to the very very top and i put on my leatherman and i start hacking but as I cut it, I was holding onto the bar and the wind came and it was pulling me off. So I was at the very, very highest point oh. of the stage. I was getting pulled off the top oh, of the stage, holding onto this bar. And Tim grabbed this pole and ripped it back in again and, and pulled me back in there. So I'm standing up there and I've just all about fallen off the top of the stage. And before joining the, the road, I was uh, very scared of heights. <laughs> and, uh, and I was sitting there and I was standing there and I looked at him and I started to cry. I was like, oh, oh come man. on, come on. Oh, <laughs> so, he's man. so he's sitting there looking at me and he's like, it's okay, I understand. And he actually um, was the only guy I knew at that time who toured with somebody who died on a lighting rig. So I think wow. he had some degree of empathy and he'd, he'd understood. Sure. Anyway, uh, so we're sitting there and we, we come down the stairs. It's so funny because we were all young. And so I thought of him as like this older guy, but he probably would have been about 30 at the time. <laughs> and um, he'd done like two Madonna tours and the Scorpions and stuff like this. And so we come down the stage and he says, Egg, do you have a, a show call? And I said, um, I'm on follow spots. And he said, okay, cool. I want you to, we'll get somebody else to do follow spots. I want to speak to you in the show. So I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. And she says, wait for me at the dimmer racks. That's just at the, just at the side of the stage. So anyway, so we got somebody else to do follow spots and the UB40 comes on and they're busy performing. And up in front of the scrim, have you ever seen those audience blinder lights? Those big lights that come on mm. and the whole audience is lit. Yeah. And they're called, they're called Molfe. And at the beginning of the show, the show starts and the band is performing and they're in one or two songs in and he grabs me and he says, come on, I want to show you something. And he takes me out and we're on the stage and then we walk up to that front bit in front of the speakers. And he says, sit here for a second for me. And so we're sitting there at the edge of the stage, looking out to the audience and the band is performing. And um, all of a sudden this big disc kind of pulse came on and the mole phase were flashing like this. And he put his arm around me, he said, never forget. And because when that happens, the crowd Whoa. cheers, like, yeah. And he said, wow. never forget, this is why we do it. Uh, this is yes. why we do it. And just seeing these like 40,000 people screaming back at you. And it was like this understanding, like it's all worth it. And it instilled this ethic and this understanding of, you know, just being there for this audience and for this, everything has higher purpose. Everything has a, a reason to do it. And um, it put me in just the best state ever. Like there's so much of who I am today that's shaped by uh, either the music that I, that I love, the punk rock ethic or my time working in music. It's inseparable. It's, it's the very essence of who I am. Mm, that's wow. super cool. 
I always, I always think about like, you know, you, you see like movie stars and rock stars and I'm always like, I would never want to be a movie star. It must be so boring behind like those cameras going cut, cut, cut every single mm. time, but a, a rock star. And then you have however many 80,000, whatever many thousand people just singing back to you just must be the best thing ever. And yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, that's even mirrored in the in the working though, because like occasionally when I work on film stuff, you know, our effects lighting was sometimes brought in, and we would sit there, we'd hate it. It's the most boring, start oh. stop, horrible, life depleting thing. <laughs> Whereas in rock and roll, you arrive, you work, you put the stage up there, you focus the lights, and then for like three hours, you walk around like you're like king of the king of the hill. Uh, you feel like guilty by association. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I is. guess also like there's a there's an upside to the streaming uh, audio side of things like you know these days because some people are obviously knocking it because of the you know the bands are having to struggle to to make money but the upside is that there's a lot more people touring like because they have to make money so I guess there's more opportunity for people to be roadies when uh, more people are on the road. <laughs> yep, there is a definite upside for that, but it's it's a weird because not a career choice most people. I would look at, but I would like highly recommend if your kids are not sure what, what to do and they don't know, like send them to some high pressure industry somewhere and working on the road is just like, I knew, but by the way, I, I was never, ever, I toured for two years. I went to my boss because originally when he offered me a full-time job, I said, but I don't want to be a roadie. I want to be in the business side of things. And he said, oh, maybe anybody who works for me, they must tour. You know, you got to understand what it's like to be on the road first. And, uh, uh, so I said, he said, just give me two years. And two years to the day, I'd been the lighting designer for the Smirnoff Fashion Awards the night before. And I went into his office and I said, Offer, you promised me two years to the day. It's been two years now. Mm. And he said, you know, you, you're wasting your talent. You know, you, you should do this. But I knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew that this was like a finishing school for me. And uh, sure enough, he said, so what do you want to do in the office? I said, I don't know. He said, okay. He said, go sit in the boardroom and figure it out. You've got three months. And uh, he just let me go and, and do my thing. And I started a conference division for the business. I uh, was in three months of selling to corporates. And that was actually what led into me starting Missing Link. But, uh, but yeah, he just let me do it. But for me, it was always it's a great two years. I would like to, instead of sending my kids to military service, I'd love to put them on the road. Yeah, yeah. there's no better way to learn, I reckon, than just sort of getting sort of thrown in the deep end a little bit. For sure. Absolutely. And you just touched on it now, like you obviously you started Missing Link at 22 years old. Um, there, there is kind of also a cool backstory a little bit. You're talking about like in South Africa uh, in winter, the concerts are sort of like a little bit dead because South Africans don't like going to concerts in winter. So maybe you can just sort of use that as a segue to tell us about um, starting Missing Link. Yeah, so I mean, it really is the case. Like in winter, we had no work. We were like jam-packed. We were together as a crew from like September all the way through to March, April. And then it started getting cold and South Africans don't go to concerts. Again, I'm from Scotland. If we didn't go to concerts when it was cold, we'd never go to any concerts ever. But uh, we all had to go and get other forms of work. And I did a few things. I worked for a scaffolding company, building scaffoldings. And uh, I worked for the SABC doing... Uh, it sounded like rugby games. You know, the guy who runs up and down the side of the field holding the <laughs> microphone. Cool. And we all had other jobs. And I thought it was so ridiculous because at the time, Gearhouse, uh, South Africa, Gearhouse had bought us out. We were the largest single supplier of staging gear on the planet in one little company. And yet we didn't have work the whole year. And it seemed insane mm. to me. And uh, I just thought it was crazy. And I thought like corporates, they have stuff. There was two markets that I identified those are rave markets because if you're out your face on drugs, apparently you don't feel the cold. And so <laughs> I, I went to our boss and said, listen, I can sell to the rave market. That happens all year. So he said, cool, try that. And then the other was the corporate market. These guys have these big conferences. And so I would go in and uh, the rave markets um, kind of picked up and we were really well known. Uh, one of my favorite stories was they would always ask us for the, the list of the lighting that we give them, like you know, 25 icons, five intelli beams. And then, but when we give them the quote, we'd also write on little things like, you know, 25 XLRs, which is a cable and, you know, 30 meters of TRX, which is an extension cable. And I remember <laughs> one of these rave flyers come out, I think it was for the mother rave. And it came out, it was like, 25 icons, <laughs> 10 telebeam, oh, 30 meters, TRX. I'm like, maybe they look at the list of the extension cable. And he's like, yeah, TRX, woo. Oh, <laughs> but, but, uh, I, I then got into the corporate and the, the, the transition to Missing Link was the realization that we would throw these 
big badass like rock and roll rigs into a conference and the shows would start and these CEOs would love it and there'd be lighting inside and maybe and there would be an amazing song and dance and they'd run onto the stage and everyone was cheering and then they'd finish the opening and then they'd start presenting and they'd be crap and it didn't matter how good we were it no matter how good the lighting sound and staging was we could not fix the presentation like it was the, the, the value of the day was defined by what they said. And then sometimes they were terrible and sometimes they were amazing. And often the guys who were amazing didn't need anything fancy from us. They just, you know, needed to be able to get on stage and do their job. And I realized there was a cure for the wrong disease. I was fixing the garnish, not fixing the steak. And uh, I, I figured there was something else that I could do. And at the time I was also the marketing manager, like any job that could be done in that company, I said, I'll do. So I ran security. I uh, had like two private investigator sting operations running, which was quite funny to stop the EFF. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, I was the marketing manager and uh, I, I was started PSL conference services. And uh, one of the guys I'd met in the marketing space, actually through the rave industry, was a, a designer. And I said to him, listen, I think we should try and do these presentation things and try and sell the stuff you do at these shows. And the first job we did was for the airports company, for AXA. And uh, that lady's son, uh, my first client, went, came on and ended up interning with us when he was 16, ended up working for us when he was 18, all the way through 1920. Uh, uh, then while he was in university in Cape Town, he uh, worked for us the whole time. And then we were walking, myself, Don Packett, my business partner, and him were walking through the biscuit mill one day. And um, he saw these guys, and that particular guy ended up... Um, picking up a microphone and rapping with these dudes, these hippie dudes. And uh, the guy's Matteo, and the guy he was rapping with was Jeremy Loops, and that's how they met. Oh, and wow. uh, yeah, 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 that was the whole story of that oh, progression from a very, very, the son of our very first client uh, went on to be the rapper in the band Jeremy Loops. Uh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. I love Jeremy <laughs> Loops. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, geez, you've, you've got such an amazing story of like all these coincidences and, and how life like comes together. But Just because uh, I'm old. <laughs> yeah, guys, yeah, it takes a bit of life to get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, when you're 44, but, you can make stories. <laughs> so maybe you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the science and the art of putting together an amazing presentation. So the truth is, it is more science than art, right? People, people process information a certain way. And the reason people uh, don't enjoy presentations is that they're not interested in the content that's delivered. The art of presenting is actually the last mile. Uh, and I realized this, that we could have people that were not great presenters. They would have audiences listening and hanging on to every single word. You know, you, you have these people who are there, sometimes they're not larger than life or they're just you know they're telling you a story and they might be quite meek and mild but you find yourself willing to lean in and listen and then you have these other people who are amazing but they get off stage and you don't remember anything they said mm. and i realize that there's a science to that and it's about making your audience care early uh, every audience in the world starts with a, they have a gas tank a give a shit tank and when you get on the stage that gas tank is empty and your job as a presenter is early on in a presentation to fill that give a shit tank as quickly as possible, as high as possible, and then to get off the stage before the give a shit tank runs out. Mm -hmm. And people get that wrong. If you do a good job of creating an itch at the beginning of a presentation, people will stick around for the scratch. But if you don't get that right, then you, know, you just have to be compelling. You have to be so amazing. You're so reliant on the art of it that uh, it becomes a very, very tricky. And, you know, people always come to us and they, they, they think they need speaking skills. They think they need to learn to speak better. But you don't deliver a good presentation. You write a good presentation. Right? A, a poor delivery of a well-written presentation will be good. A, a great delivery of a badly written presentation will be bad. And so it's how you structure your content, not how good you are when you're delivering it that matters. And, and that's what everybody gets wrong. Everyone thinks it's about public speaking, but it's actually about presentation writing. And I don't mean writing out every word, good day, ladies and gentlemen, good day to you, how are you? I mean, writing compelling material that people want to listen to and, and getting your audience to a place where they're interested and then taking them through. And once you realize that, it changes your mindset around presenting. So what, what techniques or tools do you use to sort of fill that tank up in the beginning? Can you give us some examples? 
Well, we have a structure that we follow with people. So we say that, and I certainly don't want to say that this is the only way that you should write a presentation. But what I will say is this is a way that you could always write any presentation. So you can use this tool. And we talk about it as care, believe, no do. So you have four steps in a presentation. Job number one, you have to give them a reason to care. Then you have to give them a reason to believe. Then you have to tell them what they need to know. And then you have to tell them what they need to do. And this is a narrative structure or flow or a mechanism that you can use uh, to build a presentation. So when you're preparing, uh, you kind of work to some degree backwards. So we'll sit down with somebody and we'll say, okay, we've got to start with the end of mind. What do you want the audience to do when you finish? So if you get off the stage and your audience doesn't do X, you have failed. What is X? Mm -hmm. So one of the big mistakes people make in presentations is they don't, you know, you're speaking for an hour. If you don't ask your audience to do something specific when you finish, they won't. You, you never watch a good movie and then get up and think, oh, I just watched Snatch. You know, let me go steal a diamond. You know, the, the, it's not like the, the act of watching something nice and compelling is going to compel you to action. You have to be told what to do. So we work out what that is, first of all. So, okay, cool. So what is it they uh, need, to, need, to, need to do? And they'll tell us. And then we'll say to them, okay, so what would you have to tell them in order to, make the, to give them the right tools to, to do that? And then they'll say, okay, cool. Well, I would tell them uh, this, 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 and then ask them to do that. Great. And then I would skip one step and I'd say to them, but why should they care? Like you're telling them all of this information, but why should they care enough to listen to you talk about this? Like what, what's in it for them? And they say, no, it's important to them. I said, well, what problem does what you're telling them solve for them? Because it's about them, not about you. I said, no, so it's a big problem for them. Listen, if they don't do this right, we won't be able to do such and such and this won't happen. I said, cool, but why are we not leading with that? And they say, okay, cool. And then that's what we do. And then the final thing is I'll say to them, okay, but now why are either you credible to talk about this or why is your material uh, the right material? Uh, why should they believe you? And then they'll tell me that. And then we just remap that back in. So first of all, they stand on stage and say, okay, guys, oh, I tell you, there's a problem. There's a problem that exists in the world today and that problem is this. And it's a very real problem because A, B, C, D, and E. And then the whole audience is like, wow, that is a problem. I, I actually feel that. And you say questions like, you know, guys, do you, uh, do you, do you believe me here? Do you understand? And they look at, when you nod at people, they nod back at you. And they're like, cool, we feel it. I said, well, I've recently been working as part of a research team that has done A, B, and C. We're backed by Harvard and we do this. And that's the reason to believe. So now they're like, well, I'm interested in this. I, this is a problem I have. And you, you know, backed by Harvard, you must be credible. So then now I filled their gas tank. They realize they have a problem and they believe that I'm qualified to talk about it. And then I go into the information and tell them, okay, well, this is what you need to know, A, B, C, D, and E. So now they have the tools. And then finally I close and say, but this is what you need to do. This is where we need to take it to make it happen. And, and you have to be explicit. Uh, you've got to tell the audience, this is what we need you guys to do from here on out. And then we lock that in uh, uh, you know, to finish off. And that structure will work. That is a scientific approach. Once you've got that done, if you want to, we'll, we'll you know, work with you on making sure that your delivery is better and work with you on how you communicate and how you do it to take it to you know, the next level. But for the most part, people try and fix that first. So they stand up and they, they've written a really, really bad story and then they try to deliver that well. It's, it's, it's never going to work. Where do you think like, your intuition came to to sort of put this in place and like, where did you learn about it? Cause I mean, you, you were young when you started this business. So yeah, but it, I didn't learn it early. Was it trial and um, error? Just what it was, was the realization that uh, we kept on doing, we hadn't turned it into this programmatic approach yet, but we had, uh, we ended up doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, it was quite late. Like I think that came up at SnowCon, the care, believe, no do maybe SnowCon six years ago and missing link is 22 this year. So we had, we'd been doing that thinking a lot. We'd written presentation strategies, but we'd never kind of defined it as a structure. And the reason I wanted to do that is uh, I was so frustrated that selling was required intuition. So there was only two or three of us. That Dave, the guy I told you about from the CD shop, who sold me the, um, actually it was Bad Religion and it was Pennywise. Uh, Pennywise. Uh, oh. Yeah, it was Pennywise and Bad Religion, the first ones he sold me. No effects came there. But it was that guy and I, we had to do all the selling and Don to some degree. And nobody else could be trusted. Uh, maybe Dave and Donovan by this, maybe, uh, maybe there's a few of us that could be in front of a client by this stage. But we couldn't scale the business because 
we couldn't just hire a photocopier sales guy. You had to have like years of experience understanding this. And I said, guys, we need to like turn this into a structure. We've got to make it like it's, it's, you know, three quarters baked so that anyone can sell it and just follow a format. And so it was only much later. And then we just simply said, well, you know, what do we do? What, what works normally? And then only when it was a necessity did we map it out there. So I was young when I started and the advice I gave when I started was terrible. Like I had no idea what I was doing, but I had delusional self-belief. So I had no idea what I was doing, but I was confident in it anyway. And then like we just figured stuff out along the way. I mean, we were really, really, luckily when the bar is very low, uh, which it was when we got involved, if we just made, if we just, I mean, a lot of our tricks were cheap tricks. We would add fun videos in you know different points in a presentation to make the audience laugh and and then use those as hooks of relevance for the next bit so we use those as segues and chapter markers and at this stage we hadn't you know it was you had to have a collection of these videos people emailed them around they weren't like online anywhere there was no youtube so having that bank of those videos and those cool motivational clips if we just put enough of those in somebody's presentation uh when they got off stage people were like this is the best they've ever seen but luckily the best they did, you know, the bar was low. So we kind of really, really just hacked our way to understanding and just got marginally better every year. Wow. I and think you, looking, carry on. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, you spoke about like being in front of uh, clients and stuff and, and actually you were still quite rebellious in your early years um, and you, you refused. I'm still to rebellious in my late years. And your late years. Well, well, but, but back then, you, you, were, you, wouldn't, you refused to wear long pants. Is that right? Like yeah, yeah it, was, uh, it, was my, it was my thing. So I used to wear these like weird canvas long pants. And I went to my very first punk rock show. It was Leek and Fuzzy Gish, uh, both of whom I ended up signing to a uh, uh, record label that I had. And... I, I walked in and I looked around and I was in these weird like baggy canvas pants like you'd get at hippie flea markets and everybody else was in like these knee length uh, shorty, you know, those shorts uh, that punk rock skater kids would wear and skate cargo shoes. Pants, like. <laughs> like cargo pant type things. And, and I was like, no, this is crazy. Like I look so out of place. And my, the guy who ended up starting the label with, we're still very close friends now. He lives in Toronto. Uh, we see, always talks about that first day I walked into the show. I was like, what is this crazy ass hippie doing this punk rock day? So I, I went out that weekend also to, funny enough, um, uh, Boogaloo's at Brightwater Commons, Ramberg Waterfront. I bought a whole bunch of skate shoes, <laughs> shorts, and I decided this is my new look. And from that point on, because when I started the business, I wore a suit and tie every day. Uh, and I, I, I stopped that because when I wore a suit and tie, when you're a 23-year-old and you walk in, we were having meetings with guys like, Jacko Marie, the CEO of Center Bank, and Miles Ruck, the CEO of Center Corporate Merchant Bank. When you walk into their office and you're 23 years old and you're wearing a suit, they know exactly where to place you. Then I looked like a, a graduate or an intern. I looked like them, but young. And they speak to you that way. But when you walk into their meeting and you're a business owner and you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt and you're walking into a boardroom of a big bank, now they just assume that you're this creative, different genius. Like you must be something if you're willing to walk into their office dressed <laughs> like this and so then that became my identity and i i define myself by it like even at weddings i would go to i bought these pants that you could zip off the bottom of the leg <laughs> and i would have long pants until they were married and then i'd turn them into shorts and i think from maybe 24 through 30 i didn't wear winter summer anything i didn't wear long pants this was it mm, and, and i think it was a big part of uh, selling our business because when you have a presentation company, what I realized is people didn't have a presentation problem. They, you know, they had slides and had assistants who could make their slides. What they had is a boring presentation problem. And when they looked at us, we represented the opposite of boring. So in their mind, if this was a presentation company that looked like them, we were what they were after. I want to stand on stage and not be boring. So we were a solution uh, to boring. Well, that's that's really why my smart. new book is called Boredom Slayer because that was what we set out to do. And so how did you bring, bring that sort of punk rock ethic uh, that you had just innately always had uh, into your business beyond that? So, so you know, obviously the look, um, but I guess there was an, another sort of side to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was everything. And it, it, the how was easy because it's just all we knew, right? So first of all, if you hire, everybody we hired back then, like Don Packett, who's now my business partner, I met him at a punk rock show. Uh, 
everybody we hired was from music shops, uh, punk rock shows, like maybe three or four of our editors were from punk rock shows or metal guys. But even the metal guys would be fine listening to punk. Uh, there was, so all of us were the same. And we all had this, and you mentioned it earlier, Craig, like this, the music is very positive, even though it seems like it's quite heavy. They're singing about like, you know, be better people and do the right thing and all of these kind of things. So this was this core ethic that was built into us. It's like we wanted to be uh, punk rock in every way. I remember, I mean, still Missing Link's door today it has a client that says, it has a sign and it says, no assholes allowed. And it says staff or clients. Like we don't want to work <laughs> with assholes. And I remember like one example of, of this was like, we would put our people in front of, uh, of everything. Like our, our staff absolutely and who we were was much more important than any of our clients. And we were doing this big job for Dimension Data. And the one guy had been, <laughs> I maybe shouldn't have mentioned their name, but I won't mention his name, but the one guy had called Don a liar, Don Packett a liar in, in a meeting. And the, Don had proof that the night before they had worked on his content. He'd said, change it back to this. And then the next day they'd said, you know, why have you, uh, why, why has this been changed? And he said, well, you told me to change it last night. He said, I didn't. He said, I've got it written in my book. Uh, you, and he said, no, you're a liar. And uh, Don was so upset that like, Don's integrity is like, one of the, has the most integrity of anybody I know in the world. Um, and uh, they phoned me at the office. And I was running a status meeting the following morning and uh, Don had phoned the assistant and told her what had happened. And I got into my car. I remember jumping off. We used to sit in a skateboard ramp, jumping into my car, speeding from where we were in North Riding to the office in uh, Fort Lewis and marching into the show where Don was working and ripping him out of the show and putting my whole crew out in the middle of the show and, and walking away. And we fired him in the middle of the game. Yeah, we were like, no, this is bullshit. And he ended up apologizing to us and bringing us back in. Wow. That's <laughs> But, but so sorry, interrupting the, 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 I think your batteries might be going or something because the, the sound has deteriorated quite a lot. Maybe you want to chuck the other ones in or. How's it, my man? Yo. Can you hear Smooth. us again? Yes. What a comedy of errors. Like the, it was my battery as well. <laughs> I was nice. all the way down. And then uh, uh, my, the software I use called Switch, which has all my mail and my calendar and everything, it logged me out. And then I was trying to get back in oh. again. Um, oh, I've just sent the first audio anyway. So, so that's gone. Let me just put this back on. Oh, okay, cool. Airplane mode and then start recording. I was just worried that um, uh, then I record and I record over it or something. Okay, cool, bud. Cool, man. No worries. Um, no, that's cool. Let me just go back. Okay, cool. And then I'll do it again. Cool. So, so we, we kind of finished on the punk rock epic stuff. Eh? I guess, oh, one uh, more thing. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to quickly have a lot. Like, Fuzzy Gish was, they used to have that crazy mosh pit, didn't they? They're like, they yeah, circle pit. pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a crazy. So everyone skanking, like you have what's called a circle pit, which is, it's like a mosh pit where I, it was very, very stereotypical in the ska world, which is yeah. uh, ska and punk rock were very similar. But even in puncture, in South Africa, almost all pits are circle pits. So instead of all moving uh, like into each other like this, you would all just move around in a circle. But then when the song got to a particularly crazy bit, the circle would stop and everyone would just run around and like and punch and, and jump around and stuff. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing. Like some of my fondest memories are at punk rock shows, <laughs> which, I, which I which I still you. love. Yeah, and I went to uh, Rise Against, my favorite band. Oh wow! I went to see them. Uh, the October October 2017. So I would have just turned 40, uh, 43. Oh wow! And um, I was in the middle of that pit, and I was going <laughs> batshit <it>. crazy, <laughs> loving it, throwing <laughs> children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something oh, about man. old man strength that, like, I don't know, but even if you're a youngster, you, you can't yeah, do yeah. anything about it. You've got, to, you've got to believe it. I still love it though. It's like because. If somebody falls down, just everybody stops and forms a circle and you pick them up and they're like, oh, they go down and then they're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they carry on going again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so cool, man. That's so cool. Yeah. We're massive like music fans ourselves and I love live events they, and festivals, yeah. especially. They're just so cool to go to.
<laughs> so I like like smaller shows, just because I'm not big on crowds. So I love these like more intimate, intimate venues, venues yeah. yeah, stuff like that. But that, that's more my thing. Just I, again, it's mostly because in punk rock, there's no punk rock bands that would do, you know, the, the, fest- the commercial like, festival like, thing. Do, well, it's more that they couldn't draw the crowds. Like there's yeah. not enough people. Like even when No Effects came to South Africa, you know, like 500 people went to watch them. It's not like you know, thousands and thousands of people. So they couldn't fill a big venue. It's not that they don't want to. I'm sure they'd love mm-hmm. to do a stadium, but yeah. yeah. There's only yeah. a handful like Offspring and Sum 41 and, you know, bands like that. that would maybe Blink-182 to be able to Green Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, just yeah, talking about uh, you know being a little bit older and stuff. Now, one of the things that you mentioned that you, you would like like to talk about um, is basically someone like yourself, for example, right? You you always are telling you know, or people are asking you you know to tell your story around business and presentations and you know being a rock and roll roadie. Like, so it, two two things does that kind of ever get boring? And then like you want to talk about like, you know, leaving a legacy and not being remembered for just one thing. And like, how about how you kind of reinvent yourself? So maybe you can kind of lead us into that discussion. So I think one of the challenges is that, so like, I don't think it gets boring. I enjoy the stories I shared with you guys today. There are clearly stories I enjoy telling and you know, they were fun. It's very fun. It's like a fun memory. It's a fun part of my life. The problem is the more you tell these stories, the more they double down and, and create the world's perception of who you are. Because people don't want to talk about, you know, how it was at dinner last night. And, you know, they, they want to know about what those big events are. So, so your life gets defined by a series of events in your past. And I think there's an easy risk to fall into thinking that's who you have to be going forward. Because the whole world knows you, you know, this, this idea of branding. Oh, well, my brand is that I must be this person. Therefore, I've got to keep being that. And I, I, I want to fight against that idea. Like, I don't want my past to define my future. I want to, like, go through this life having uh, evolved and changed and experienced as much as I possibly can. And, you know, right now, like, in my space, you know, people, you can always see who you are based on what other people define you as. So like the usual term I'll get is either a public speaker, uh, but it's not like it's never been my job, right? It's always just been like a profitable hobby or uh, uh, they'll say uh, entrepreneur. But again, like I, I don't want that to be everything. You know, I just came back off holiday this week and you know, I had to go back to work and it's not, it's not great. It's not like this is my calling and my passion. You know, if I could be at home and reading books and having rad conversations with people all day and playing games and, you know, I would, I, I would do stuff. I would find cool stuff to do, but if I didn't have to get up and go to work every day to order to make money. I wouldn't. I, I want to do it right now because I still feel like I have something to prove. I feel like I'm in the shadow of other successful people. I've got this idea of, of happiness and that um, happiness is such a relative term. If, 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 if I sell a business in South Africa for, you know, 200 million rand, if I stay in South Africa, I will be happy for the rest of my life because in South Africa, selling a business for 200 million rand is a big significant thing and I won't feel like I have anything to prove. But if I sell that for 200 million rand and then move to uh, the States, you know, having sold a business in Silicon Valley for uh, $10 million or $15 million isn't nearly as successful. So then I would have to measure myself against something else. And it's like picking the point in your individual treadmills that you choose to step off and, and, and define yourself by something different. And I still think I have something to prove uh, from a business perspective. I, I feel like uh, I've been um, uh, comfortably unsuccessful and I want to try and make sure that that changes. I want to prove that I actually can build a significant business, not just a, or like a financial business, not just a cool business. And um, so I've got something to prove there. But at that point, I realized that I will jump off that treadmill. It was, uh, it's simply just to check that box and then I want to do something else. I don't know what it is yet. I maybe want to write fiction or, or I, don't, I don't know, but I want to redefine my life going forward. So I've mm-hmm. got a peg in the sand of, uh, or peg in the, where I need to get to, uh, my victory condition for the next few years. I'm willing to double down to get that. But if, if I'm back on your show, 10 years from now, and I'm still trying to run a business and prove it to myself, I'll consider it a personal failure, no matter how successful I have been, you know, in those, inter- in, in those years, because your success is defined by your, t- your victory condition, not by other people's perception of what, what's good. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, and off the back of that, 
Uh, Rich, you've got some interesting sort of thoughts on work and purpose and your passions and these kinds of things. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about like how you see that. Well, so I don't, I think that work and passion, I mean, I think you should be passionate about what you do. I, like, I think you should be feeling like you're solving something meaningful, solving a meaningful problem. I do believe that making people, I believe that uh, people not being trained to communicate well is a travesty. I think the world, you know, my son, he wants to, he's an, a phenomenal speaker. He's 15 years old. He's really, really great when he stands up and speaks, but he wants to be an astrophysicist. And, and recently I said to him, you know, you're still going to push your public speaking. He said, yeah, dad, I want to be a physicist. I said, but kiddo, you know, a physicist that can speak is going to be a lot better off mm. than a physicist who can't. Uh, you know, this is a very important thing for you to understand. And I believe that's universally true. I think in almost any version of any job, if you can communicate what you do well, you have a slightly unfair advantage. So I'm very passionate about that, but it's not my passion. You know, I, I don't believe that we get told these things all the time. You know, chase your, find what you love and then do that. You know, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. It's just not true. You know, if I owned a board game shop, that would be a terrible idea. I find ways to incorporate the things I love, like board games, into my work. But the moment it becomes too much of a chore, it kind of kills the love. And also, I realize that uh, even my hobbies are cyclical. So I'll be obsessed about board games for maybe another two or three years, and then maybe I'll be moving on to something else. Mm -hmm. And I, if I've already defined who I am and I'm stuck in that space, if I own a board game shop, well, then I can never quit on it, right? I, I, I have to stick with it. So I think it's important to become passionate about what you're doing, uh, more about chasing your passion. And, uh, you know, your mileage may vary. That's certainly true for me. Yeah, that's very, very. So just to go back a, a little step, um, what, what does the future kind of mean for you? Like, you know, what, what, what do you want to kind of be known as? Uh, do you have any idea or you, do you still f feel you're figuring it out? I want to be known as uh, such a, it's like such dishbaggy stuff to say. I want to feel like I was significant and smart, right? I, like this idea of people saying, oh, you know, you don't want to, like, I would like to be famous for being clever. <laughs> like, it's, I, I have these ideas in my head that I feel like I want the world to understand. I think they'd be helpful for, for people. And I'd like to be at a point at which I could be considered like a thought leader. And it's not, not like a speaker. It's not that I want to be a, but I'll, a speaker as such, but that is a manifestation of how this comes across. Like I'd like to write more and talk more and do some significant things that are separate from my income stream. So, you know, I could I'd be speaking at these big events around the world. It wouldn't be that I'm getting paid to do it necessarily, but it would be that the people want to listen. Uh, I want to be the person that people would like to come and see deliver a talk as opposed to arriving someplace and I'm just the, the guy that was booked. You know, like I want to feel like I'm uh, uh, significantly more significant than I am now. And I want my ideas to have a better chance of, of growing. And, and I also want to be uh, comfortable being as contentious as I can be. I often hold back because I think if I say things I'm thinking and it will offend people. And, you know, in today's day and age, if you, your career can be destroyed uh, in the drop of a hat mm -hmm. by saying something that uh, maybe very, very far left political people wouldn't agree with. And I want to get to a point in my life where I can tell people, you know, like old, old men, um, old people, there's a point in which everybody in their, in, their, in their life, they have like, I don't know what it is and I don't know where it is on me, but somewhere on me, it's a little give a fuck chip, right? And one day I'm going to be walking along and it's going to just fall and I'm going to lose it, right? And it happens to all old men and <laughs> like old men, one day they wake up and they I just don't give a fuck anymore. And they're just like angry old men. And you, it doesn't matter what you say to them. They can just be angry. And I really want to be that guy. <laughs> I want to be able to be at, a, be at a point where I can say, because I believe in it, I can say things that might upset people, might offend people, but it's okay because it's the truth and we can, it can help us move forward. And uh, that requires uh, no longer being financially dependent on what I, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis on my job. Mm. So I, I, need to, I need to get out of the point where I feel that I need to, to earn money I need my investments and my wealth to be at a point in which that's, that's okay. And then I, then I have freedom to, to pursue uh, what, I, what I need to pursue. And I guess that's maybe the, the most important goal at the moment is to get to a point where I am not required 
uh, to make income. So then, then, then I feel like I'd be truly free to a degree. Right now, I think I'm comfortably poor. <laughs> But 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 just okay, just to kind of like discuss this a little bit, where is the yardstick exactly? So for example, you know, you talk about people wanting to come and speak to you, or speak with you, listen to you speak. Like for us, for example, like speaking to you is, is a massive privilege. We're like, oh my gosh, you know, we can't believe we're speaking to Rich on our podcast. It's like it's it's a real big thing. Um so whose eyes are you kind of like looking through when it comes to this? Do you have any idea? Well, well, my own, right? Have you ever like, done something where, like maybe you're cooking and you cook a meal and you look at it and you think, well, it's good, I never liked it, but I think I could have done better. So mm. there's a guy, I saw this guy a few years ago. I was at a global leadership academy and it was like 25 people from around the world were on this thing in Washington, D.C. And this guy, Warren Rustand, is an amazing human being, uh, was the kind of core, core facilitator. He worked for two American presidents, run multiple Fortune 500 business, or Fortune 100 businesses, and one of the things he said is he said, one's success is only important when measured against one's potential. And mm-hmm. uh, I remember this rocking me to my very core. And I actually think like, I, like I want to go and spend time with Warren. Uh, he's got this ranch and it's like one of my goals to spend maybe a weekend with him. And like, I almost want to be angry with him about that phrase because he set me up never to be happy. Like Elon Musk is never, he's going to be sitting on Mars getting a blowjob, and he's still going to think, ah, <laughs> oh, th- there's more. <laughs> There's more in here, right? Like, like he's never going to sit there and think, okay, I have now fulfilled my potential, right? And chasing your potential is very, very tricky because whenever you get there, you always feel like there's something more to give. And I think that's fantastic, but it's actually a, le- a lesson in, in like you're then constantly staying, living in a state of uh, perpetual failure because you've not made it yet. And I think that is why it's important for you to peg certain goals in the ground and say, well, if I get there, and uh, move to something else. Because when you get there, it's so easy to say, well, I'm not as famous as this guy, but uh, I'm you know, not more famous. You know, last year I did that one show with um, uh, Will I Am and Malcolm Gladwell. And there was billboards everywhere of all these speakers, but I never made any of the billboards. You know, I was like uh, also, with, uh, <laughs> uh, also featuring Richard Mulholland. And like part of me, the ego, and it's more the case, like I want to feel like I deserve to be on the stage. Like, I feel like when I'm there, I'm, you know, I earn my position and I'm, you know, capable and I can hold my own, but I'm still obscure. So on my own yardstick, I, I, there's work to be done. I've got to, I've got to be better. Uh, and I appreciate that. I mean, it's amazing. as a privilege to be on your show. I appreciate that you feel that there's something there, but I still feel like I have a ways to go. What's important is that I don't get stuck on that treadmill because there's always going to be something there. So I want to peg it. Uh, I want to speak at several events around the world properly. And then I feel like, okay, cool. Then in that space, I'm okay. I want to build a business that's sold for a certain amount to be financially secure. So my wife and my children and myself can guarantee a certain living standard. We don't want more than we have. We really, really don't. We just want to make sure that what we have is preserved. And then I can write kids' books or works of fiction or all kinds of other things I want to do. Or I don't know what. Maybe, you know, I have I do a couple of seasons as a snowboard instructor. Like, I'd love to to collect other cool parts to my life. It's really interesting, Rich. I think this is a really interesting topic because it, it comes back to just general happiness, I guess, uh, as, as a human being. And, and when you set yourself lofty goals... Uh, or, or um, as one progresses and you become this this being that's becoming bigger and bigger in in your eyes, let's say in the, in the world, you also then, like you say, you have even loftier goals. And and when your when your reality doesn't meet your expectation, that's when you get unhappy. Um, and I suppose you, in a way, by having big goals, you almost can set yourself up for for not being happy. But at the same time, if you you know you have to have these things in life to keep moving forward. So I guess it's it's like a, a weird sort of anomaly, isn't it? Right. But why move forward? Why can't we move laterally? You know, I was watching ice hockey this morning, and this guy William Nylander is like this young Maple Leaf. And Maple Leafs are one of the most iconic teams in the world. And this guy is maybe 21 years old, and he's playing there. But he, everyone's like, "Oh, Nylander is crap, and he's not playing well." This is this guy. This young Swedish child is playing at the, you know, one of the best teams in one of the most aggressive leagues on the planet. But relative to the, the other you know, 15-odd people he's standing next to, they're saying at the moment he's not good enough. But like on who's, how do we, you know, you're constantly going to be measured on where you're at. 
And this idea of only moving forward it assumes that you have to move forward in the space that you're in. So I have to get better speaking gigs, or I have to write a book that sells more copies, or I have to do more things. But actually, if I decided to become a chef or to open a coffee shop, or my, my world would now be defined by a new set of criteria. And, and that excites me. Right? Mm. It excites me to be a beginner again and to see if I can progress in a different space. But it doesn't have to have any financial uh, aspect to it. It could be, I could become a teacher. I could become, I've always fantasized about being a private investigator. Like I think I'd be a cool or a detective. Like I, like I imagine, I wonder if I could you know, go get a job in the police at 50. I don't know. Like maybe... You know, how would that look like? Could, could, could that happen? Could I spend 15 years being a policeman or an investigator? Uh, Bryce Courtney, do you know who he is? Yeah, Power of One. Yeah, the Power of One, right? So that's how we all know Bryce Courtney. But Bryce Courtney wrote The Power of One after he retired. He was a very well-renowned advertising executive in the advertising industry. And, you know, he retires, quits his job in advertising. And everyone's like, oh, well done. Great career, Bryce. And he was Mr. Ad Guy in Australia. And then, of course, he reinvented a whole other career and he became Mr. Amazing Author. <laughs> that excites me. Yeah. Like, I yeah. want to confuse the world. I want the world to look at the book of my life when I'm dying and I want them to not know where they're supposed to file it. Like, yeah, I don't want it to be obvious in which category in the bookshop it's supposed to be in. Uh, exactly. yeah. yeah, that's cool. I like that a lot. Um, you. you you do have some uh, legacy uh, as well that, that, that does involve sort of bigger picture stuff, obviously, as well. Um, which, and I'm talking about your, your company called uh, Human Rights. Um, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about um, that and, and another sort of avenue that you've, you've gone down. Yeah, so I own a business called Human Rights, which is a, a notebook company. We make notebooks for every book we sell. We give away 10 books to kids or one of the new packages is five uh, little storybooks to kids, uh, to one kid. And uh, it was just started as a, a social initiative uh, to kind of prove that a business could grow if it, if, even if it had a, a cool purpose baked in. I was very inspired by, I'd seen Blake Mykoski speak at an event in Norway. He was the founder of Tom Shoes. Mm. And I was blown away by this idea and I was kind of lit a fire in my brain. And then I saw this lady speak at an EO event um, who'd started a charity called the Campbell Levanto. Her name was Helen Lieberman. And it was like one of these stories is so inspirational that you sit there and you think I've done nothing with my life. Like I'm a shit and she's amazing and I need to, I need to do better. And I went up to her afterwards and I said, you know what, what do you need? How can I help? And she said, um, we need storybooks written for South African children. We're getting lots of books giving away and we're, we're giving these little kids in the townships, you know, Jack and Jill. We need African stories and beautiful localized stories written. And I just happened to be, I'd spoken at an event a few weeks before called Net Profits. And these two guys in the audience had reached out and asked me if I could offer some advice and if we could meet for a breakfast. And we went and we sat down and um, we're having breakfast. And they said they had this idea of a, a stationery company. They were going to sell stationery supplies to ad agencies. And for every one protractor they sold or ruler they sold, they'd give away a ruler to kids. And I had just met this lady, Helen Lieberman, like two days before. And I was like, guys, what if we narrowed it down, did something else, and what if we figured out a way to give books to these children? And they loved it. And then we came up with the, the, the idea of the rightsable in the book and the whole thing. And we went up and became business partners. And we still have the best of friends today. And that's how we started the business. It's super cool. And it's a, it's a great name as well. Human rights, like W R I T. I, I yeah. I, I remember when I came up with it and I was so excited and I yeah. wanted to show the guys and I had this little program called Zen brush on, on my phone. And I said, I, I don't want to tell you, I don't want to see it because I don't have to explain it. I want to write it and show you. And I wrote it with my finger on this app. And then I turned around and I showed it to them and it said uh, human rights. And I was, I mean, it looked because if I, if I do it now, even it'll always look, the same way and I went like this and I wrote it and I turned around and Adrian the designer uh, was there I was like dude this is it this is how I want it to be cool. uh, <laughs> oh, it was so like cool. send me that send me that and that actually wow. just became the logo you know cool, we actually man. was just how I wrote oh, it so on that cool. thing. It's epic. God, I hope I didn't mess up my recording here no, we're still good. <laughs> and and that, that's how it came about. I was like so excited. And yeah. And then they turned the original handwriting thing into the, into the logo. So it's Ooh. kind of stuck out yeah. there. Yeah. 
That's really cool, man. So, so, but uh, just before we, we finish off, you've obviously had tons of business experience, life experience too. There's a couple of things that kind of resonate and stand out for me. You know, I'm sure there's, there's, there's millions of others as well. Um, but you talk about the importance of showing up and not living with regret. Uh, what, what advice do you give to, to people in life and in business? And I just, I mean, I was lucky enough to experience a person who was very close to me's life regret when I was young enough for it to sink in. And, uh, you know, it's a, a story that I was quite lucky that went quite viral uh, when, I, when I told it. But it was a, a great aunt who had fallen in love when she was in her 20s and she'd met a person and then for circumstantial reasons ended up never seeing him again and splitting up. And just before I take her, took her to the home a few days before she died, she was crying and she was telling me, you know, I wonder what my life would have been like if I'd married Leslie John Moore. And I thought, sure, what a horrific thing. Like, I just never want to be sitting there uh, with my grandchild regretting stuff I didn't do. And even when I look back, like I've made terrible mistakes. So, like my life has certainly not been perfect, but I've tried stuff like and I, I, I've, I've given it a good shot. And at least the one thing that currently, I mean, there's certainly, I, I don't want you to think, you know, people have this kind of weird view. You ask people, you know, if you could redo your life, would you do anything differently? And only an arsehole would say, no. Like, are you mad? I would start investing 20% of my paycheck from, you know, the day I started working. I would definitely <laughs> do that differently. If you didn't start investing when you're 18 and you have a chance to go back and not do that, you're, you're an idiot twice. Right. Like, like, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. I would have started investing earlier. Uh, but, you know, and I certainly do regret that I didn't do that, but it's fixable. You know, I can focus on getting that done now. I don't want anything meaningful. I don't want to regret not trying things. I'd far rather try something and fail it than uh, not try it. Because I talk about this idea that everything you say no to in your life, uh, at that point you say no to it, you're writing a check payable later in your life to regret. And I, I think we have to be better curators of our future self. I mentioned this earlier, but every decision you make, when you go to bed at night, I mean, you rip off your shoes. Right? You just take off your, your, I came back from gym yesterday and I ripped off my sneakers. And then I quickly bent down and I untied the laces because future version of me, the woke up this morning, it has to tie the, has to untie those laces. And I would rather give future me a better chance. And uh, I want to make sure, and, and it's future me that has to deal with the regrets of decisions that I didn't make and the decisions I make today. And I think you need to always sit there. Like, I want to keep a diary. I was hoping to actually start doing it this year. Uh, but every morning when I wake up and think, like, what am I committing to do today for future me? And um, what did past me, how did past me drop me in the shit today? You know, past me had that pizza for dinner. Like, and I know past me enjoyed it, but now present me has to work out twice as hard and has mm. to, you know, really not eat, uh, you know, eat very, very well today because past me was greedy. And there, there are these three versions of you, this past you, present you and future you. And you're, you need to be better, you know, you need to be a better relay team uh, for mm. yourself. And regret is a big part of that. And unfortunately, future future me is a person who has to cash all of those checks payable to regret. And I want to make sure that they have a, as close to a zero sum game to, um, to pay off later. You know, that South African philosopher. And I, I struggle to agree with him, but he, he's an, I don't know if the term is anti-natalist. Have you heard of the movement? I think so. Yeah, um, he was on another podcast. On another we listened. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, David, yeah. someone or other. Yes, he was with Jordan Peterson on the uh, Renegade Report. Did you yeah. to that? No, it didn't. Not but that, we have no. heard him on another podcast, and he was quite. Right, so he basically believes that um, we would have been better off. The worst thing your parents ever did was had you. You'd be mm. better off because life is suffering, and uh, I think the first thing we have to you didn't prove well to me was that suffering is bad, because we, it seems like we pursue suffering. You know, people train for months and suffer uh, for you know, an Ironman and then they do the race and they have that moment of euphoria. Like we seem to be suffering machines, like we, we seem to like it. But I do struggle with this idea, the idea that the end of your life is hard and often filled with regrets and difficulty. And often when people look back at their life, the whole thing didn't feel worth it. And I wanna kind of do better. I wanna, I wanna do my best to try and prove that guy wrong. I wanna, no matter how much suffering there is there in my life, if I, you know, I have a painful death and things happen, I want to make sure that I do a good enough job to say, ha, you know, in my case, buddy, you were wrong. 
like I, like I, I feel like I owe it to myself to, to do the best I possibly can to say to him, I'm glad my parents had me. And it seems mm-hmm. like such a, when you first hear him, you feel like, oh, this guy's a bit of a crackpot. And then you sit and you think about it a lot, yeah. which I have done. And I think, oh, there's a lot to be said for what he's saying. There is a, like, even in a good life, there's a lot of suffering. You know, you, sp- you spoke, uh, Craig, I think it was you earlier when you were talking about the privilege and the different lives we have. But life is shit for everybody. Like, and that's his whole hypothesis is that, you know, no matter whether you're born in a, in a small little shanty town in Africa, it's all, you're always measured against your surroundings. Yeah. And, uh, and his hypothesis is that life for humans is, is difficult and hard and you would have been better off not having it. And um, it becomes actually difficult to prove him wrong. Uh, the average human life probably, you know, wouldn't be that great. Uh, uh, and you've got to work hard to prove a guy like that wrong. And I think I want to make sure I do. I love that. I think also, you know, knowing that it's going to be tough and it is going to be hard and you wake up kind of knowing that then it's fine. You're like, cool. Uh, little challenges. Cause every time you overcome a small challenge, you feel good. And so uh, if you've got lots of little challenges, you feel good actually a lot because you overcome them. And I guess there's some kind of weird thing that, like you say, we actually as human beings kind of uh, we just kind of gravitate towards uh, struggle sometimes, but Maybe that's what it's all about sometimes, and maybe it's not a bad thing. You know, at the end of the day, you 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 become a uh, this improved human being maybe on some level by going through tough times, and and maybe that's the value of the life. You know, so yeah, but it is a it is an interesting theory. I think that's what we are, right? I think we are problem solving machines. That's why I don't worry about AI taking over. People are like you know, what if AI is coming take over and they lose all of our job? We all lose our jobs. Well, so what? Right? It's not like we're here to work, right? Work is what we do in order to do other stuff. But what will happen is we'll do what we've done consistently throughout his history is we'll just solve something new. And there's always something like that's what we do. Like we, we, we chase conflict, we chase struggle, and we try to actively solve stuff. Like we, we, as a, the one thing that the species has never been as satisfied. And um, that's, that's an interesting proposition. And it, it does speak to this idea that we're, we're, we're struggling. We're constantly in some, we're struggling with something and we're constantly trying to fix stuff and get better. And I think that's why I get excited about, you know, I love the idea. I think capitalism ultimately will be one of the shortest, it'll be a very important period of human history, but it'll be a very, very short lived one. You know, the true capitalism as we know it will exist for maybe, let's say we've got another 50 years running that way before we have to have some sort of universal basic income or something will make, uh, will kill capitalism as we know it. So you'll have this kind of two, 300 year period in, of history that will mm-hmm. just have been this significant in that the switches it flicked and how it changed us. But I'm far more excited about what we start solving when, when we take that up, when we no longer have to worry about living, about paying the bills and you know, staying alive. What kind of crazy rad shit are we going to solve there? <laughs> mm-hmm. and, that, and, that, and there'll still be suffering. There'll still be all of those things. Everything will be consistent. But then we'll be solving really meaty, meaningful problems. And I'm so excited. And, you know, I, I would love to live to see some of that happen. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That'll not. be ridiculously human, right? That, that, that's <laughs> us at because we are ridiculously human. That's the, who we are. Yeah, totally, bud. Well, you've, uh, you've just said that word. And I think, um, you know, uh, it's nice to always ask our guests, what does a ridiculously human mean to you? Uh, yeah, yeah, ridiculous. Chasing discomfort uh, and never being comfortable. It is the most ridiculous thing that uh, we live these lives where we should be, by, by any standard, we have it better than anybody who came before us. The poorest people alive today practically have it better than the richest people from 100 years before but we still upset and we still never satisfied and we are uh, still chasing discomfort and, and reveling in it. And I think it's, as I said, I think it's ridiculous, but I think it's pretty damn cool. I think it's why we progress and currently why we're the top of the food chain. Cool, man. And Rick, just before we say cheers, uh, what is the best way uh, for our listeners to get in touch with you, to find out about you, to follow you, et cetera? Uh, if you go to my Twitter bio at Rich Mulholland, uh, there's a little link in there and it's a Linktree account. I don't know if you guys use Linktree. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a little Linktree account. And it's link, Linktree 
slash Rich Mulholland or whatever. And that links to everything. My newsletter, my YouTube channel, my Facebook page, Instagram, like where you can buy the books. And that little link, link tr.ee forward slash Rich Mulholland uh, will get you everywhere you need to go. I'd love you to come and join the newsletter. And that's probably the best uh, that you could do. Sign up for the newsletter. And then I'll share all the thinking when I'm on different podcast shows, uh, gigs, all kinds of stuff there. And like stuff that I think about. Cool, man. Is that, is that like a personal newsletter you send out or like your, your business one? Is it? No, it's like very personal. It's every three weeks or so I send it out on a Saturday morning. It's literally the least scheduled uh, <laughs> newsletter in the history of newsletters. And it's just when I find enough cool stuff that, that, that I've been enjoying looking at or finding or cool new tools and software and stuff, then I just send it out and uh, do that. I'll probably try to get better at that this year. Cool, cool stuff. Man. Well, but I just wanted to quickly say thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, you certainly are a ridiculously cool, ridiculously interesting human. Um, thanks so much. You definitely, ah, you definitely made me more curious as well. And that's what I love. My, I think. my wife just walked past me naked. <laughs> <laughs> the timing is pretty good. <laughs> um, that's why I look distracted. But oh, sorry, yeah. that, that just threw me in the middle of your beautiful ending. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, man. Yeah. So I was just saying, like, you have definitely made me more curious. And, you know, to, I want to, like, look at things a little bit more differently now. And definitely, like you said, try to write my story a little bit differently so that I'm not just this person, but I, but I'm someone else. And I love the idea of trying new things and new professions. Why not do something completely different? You know, why don't I go and work on Fridays with a, a guy down the road that I love and, um, you know, get him to teach me how to build and renovate houses. You do know what I mean? Like that's, it's really kind of given me that, um, mindset shift, which is really, really awesome. And yeah, just thank you for being so honest um, and for being so charismatic as a person. Um, in, in my eyes, you, you definitely are a motivation and inspiration. And it's been an absolute privilege to have you on our podcast. So thank you so much, buddy. That's amazing. Thank you. Just everything you said there was fantastic. I mean, even if I made you question one little thing, that's, that's phenomenal for me. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Okay. So just real briefly, Rich, from my side, like, so much that we could have got into today um you know just you're such a person with so much depth and uh and it just really does show and maybe it's age but i will call it depth you know so um but but it's uh really you know the idea like gary said of of moving like, like you mentioned moving lateral like i love that as well like you know we always we we i think we're still in this sort of mindset of of you know get the gold watch at being in an industry for 50 years it's still in our consciousness even though it's probably is shifting um, and, and I think it's such a cool idea to, to just reinvent and constantly check in with future you. I think that's something that I'm going to definitely be, be doing more often on the, the choices you make now, you know, tying your shoelaces or untying them before bed, such cool, um, tips and tricks. And, uh, so thanks again. And we, we can't wait to see, uh, the future uh, Richard Mulholland. It's going to be an epic little journey. I can sure that so thanks a lot once again and i can't wait to see the future of ridiculously human i like i really really enjoyed this i think you guys got a great thing going so it's such a privilege being on the show so thank you very much cool man uh, thanks, thanks buddy cool man. man thanks bud so, thanks a lot bud awesome, really cool awesome. chat man sorry we over in five minutes sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. At all. let me just um send this to you quickly so this is the second one as well Sheesh, we did we did went Do you guys always go so long is that no like, no, uh, no not, not usually no yeah, no, not normally. We 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 try and we we used to at the start, and then we we're like, no, we need to get a bit more um, concise, like, like just more concise, and a bit more, you know, respective of our listeners' time as well. Um, but also, we we like we give ourselves two hours for uh, technical issues the whole, at the start. The whole like thing. Like we had, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also, but sometimes we do have lang cool chats. You know, well, most like of the time today, we have yeah. lang cool chats, and then we we have that leeway to kind of extend it if we want. So. It's, it's so challenging because it's like Tim Ferriss' podcast. They're very long and I really enjoy them. But yeah. I, I only have, you only have so many gaps mm. in which you're willing yeah. to invest like, you know, an hour and a half yeah. into to do. So I gravitate yeah. like my hockey podcast. I have a daily one I listen to. It's like 10 minutes. Yeah. And then, you know, and yeah. I've got this kind of 45-minute mark. But sometimes it's nice to, to go deep and, and just, just take it a bit further. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for for doing that and allowing us to do yeah, that. It's thanks, buddy. Valuable, man. No problem.
Yeah. Brad, guys. Doc. Hey, cool, man. Take it easy. Oh, and, um, have a good one. Hope to chat again soon. Yeah, but thanks so much. Hey, have a great weekend, man. Speak so, to so, you. So, just, yeah. you know, just the, the pictures quickly. Just, yeah, um, yeah. I, I'll message uh, Taryn. Okay. Just ask for like uh, sort of four okay, or five. Cool. Like, got, I'll, yeah, ask, I'll message him. Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. All right, thanks buddy. again. You've got a whole show just on the importance of having a Taryn. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Rich. Okay, man. Just about to you. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging for change.